Hi everyone. Uh, in this video I want to talk about a sequence of events that is called in Zulu the Umthakane. Uh, in Sutu uh, the word is Difakane. Um, and it means something like time of troubles. Um, and, and this encompasses a whole uh, series of wars and migrations uh, over the course of about 20 or 30 years in the early 19th century. Um, and uh, to understand why this happened and the course of action that uh, followed from uh, the initial phases of this, we have to um, have a sense of uh, the societies and the, the shape that they took in the eastern part of what is now South Africa. Uh, in the early 19th century, the, the people collectively known as Unguni, and uh, these are you know, the, the Bantu-speaking peoples of the eastern part of South Africa. Uh, various languages are descended from this uh, proto-Unguni. Um, these would include Zulu and Kosa and uh, uh, Siswati um, and Ndebele. Um, and those, I guess, those are the main ones. Um, uh, these tend to be languages with uh, with clicks in them, uh, but they're they're Bantu languages that absorb the the clicks from the Khoisan language. Um, in any case, uh, these are the the languages that are that were common or that kind of descended from or resulted from the Mfekane that descended from uh, the Nguni languages that were spoken previous to this. Um, and there was a lot of change, uh, social change going on in. Uh, among the Nguni people uh, in the late 18th and early 19th century. Um, different uh, political entities taking shape and transforming uh, different chiefdoms uh, emerging during this period. The early 19th century also saw a uh, severe drought in the eastern part of South Africa, which prompted people to band together uh, in larger groups uh, in order to secure food supplies and things like this. So there's, I mean, this is a period of dramatic social change. The two main Nguni chiefdoms that emerged uh, by the 18 teens were called the Mtetwa and the Ndwandwe. Um, the, uh, the Ndwandwe was headed by a, a fellow named Zwide and the Mtetwa uh, by a, a guy named Dingiswayo. Um, and these two um, tended to be in conflict with each other. There were wars between the Mtetwa and the Ndwandwe. Um, and it was among the Mtetwa that a figure uh, who would be truly monumental in the history of South Africa uh, emerged. And this was Shaka, uh, otherwise known as Shaka Zulu. Um, and uh, not only will, do we discuss him in this uh, lecture, but we also are reading a monograph about Shaka. Um, it should be noted that that monograph is not a biography of Shaka. Uh, it rather is a study of the, the legacy of Shaka, what he has meant to people in South Africa, um, uh, not both, well, starting in, uh, during the time of his life, but uh, especially after his death, how he became a symbol. Um, of uh, a kind of marker of Zulu identity, as well as uh, a symbol that was used by uh, the Europeans in the, in the colonial setting um, to do a number of things. And, and that uh, image or legacy of Shaka has uh, been um, employed in more recent times, and specifically in the 1980s and 1990s, around the end of apartheid, uh, for uh, a number of reasons as well, right? And so Carolyn Hamilton, who is the author of that book, uh, gets into all of this, and uh, we can have a further discussion about this in the live session. Uh, for our purposes here, I want to go over some of the, uh, the things that Shaka did, some of the innovations that he introduced. Um, the classic image of Shaka is this one. This was a drawing done that was published, I believe, in a European newspaper uh, in the 1820s while he was still alive. He died in 1828. Um, and uh, I, I think that, you know, this is a really interesting image. Um, if we were in class, I would ask you what you think about it. Um, uh, and one of the things you might notice, first of all, is that uh, he has, he's wearing a headdress that has a really long feather on it. 
First of all, I don't know what kind of bird produces a feather like that or why one would wear a single feather that sticks up that high in a headdress of some kind. Uh, it seems rather ridiculous. Um, and uh, so that's the first clue that maybe there's something off about this image. Uh, but there are a couple of other things. If, if you understand uh, what Shaka was all about and, and uh, the, the innovations that he introduced, um, the way that he transformed and innovated, uh, um, there are a number of other things wrong with this image, right? So I think that the feather comes from just a kind of standard European image that uh, they had of Aboriginal peoples across the world, right? Um, uh, Native Americans were usually depicted with feather headdresses, for instance, right? Um, and, uh, you know, if this is an ostrich feather or something like that, that is kind of transposed from maybe the Americas to Africa. Um, you know, uh, African groups did wear feathers uh, for decorations, but I have never seen a headdress like this uh, among any peoples in Africa, or for that matter, any peoples anywhere in the world, right? This is totally a product of the European imagination. The other things that are products of the imagination here are the shield and the spear, okay? Uh, for the simple reason that the Zulu did not use large shields like this or long throwing spears, okay? Um, this was more akin to the types of weapons that were used traditionally among Bantu peoples. Uh, if you recall from an earlier lecture, uh, warfare um, among Bantus tended to be uh, rather small scale, um, kind of symbolic or ritualistic. Uh, it was done to avenge a slight to personal honor. Uh, it was done to try to secure a bit of cattle or something from a rival group. Uh, and it tended to consist of uh, the warriors in the society lined up with a large shield and a throwing spear and kind of launching their spears at each other, and eventually one side would kind of uh, decide they'd had enough um, because maybe a few of their their warriors had been hit with these spears and suffered serious wounds. Um, and so they would uh, declare an end to this. They would sue for peace or they would run away or something like that. Then there would be an exchange of property uh, or some kind of restitution for slighted honor or something like that, and then everyone would go on with their lives, right? Um, warfare was not about conquest, and that's an important distinction here, right? Uh, nothing approached the, the total warfare that was seen in the modern Western world, okay? At least not until Shaka came along, right? Um, and that's, that's part of what we want to talk about today, but, uh, you know, we, we want to, uh, discuss the, the broader effects of Shaka's military innovations. Okay, so let's, let's cover what Shaka did militarily first. All right. Um, rather than the large shields and long throwing spears that were traditionally employed in Bantu warfare, Shaka gave his soldiers, and so let's look at the, the image down here, gave his soldiers short stabbing spears and these tended to have rather large or broad heads on them, uh, spear points on them, um, that could be used not only to stab, but also to slash if necessary. Okay. Uh, also, small shields that could be held uh, easily in one hand um, and were used simply to parry uh, so that the warrior could get in close and use the stabbing spear. Uh, Zulu warriors, some of them also carried a small hatchet uh, or um, this uh, instrument called an iwisa, um, which uh, was a, a kind of mace. Um, if you've seen the, the film Black Panther, uh, which is really a sort of terrible colonial mashup of a number of... I mean, I like the film. Okay, let me, let me not criticize it too much. I, I think I, I like Marvel films. I like the superheroes and all of that. But the images of Africa are really stereotypical. Um, there is one character in Black Panther, though. Uh, in, his name is M'Baku. Uh, he is the head of the Jabadi. I, I saw this only recently, uh, again, for the third or fourth time with my kids, uh, who are big Marvel fans. Um, M'Baku is the head of the Jabadi tribe, uh, kind of the rival group of T'Challa, the king. Um, anyway, I don't want to get into a long summary of Black Panther here. 
but uh, in warfare, he carries this large mace-like looking thing that has a round head on it. Um, that is called that is the traditional Zulu iwisa. Um, in European languages, this is called a knob carry. Okay, it's just made of hard wood. All of these weapons. The, uh, the short stabbing spear, the iwisa, and the, the hatchet. Um, uh, and really it was to the warrior's preference, I guess, uh, to decide which one he wanted to use. Um, all of these are for close combat. And this is one of the main innovations that Shaka introduced into warfare. In addition to that, because he was all about close combat, he introduced this engulfing maneuver. This was called the bull's horns or the buffalo horns for quite an obvious reason here that you can see, right? Um, uh, and this is how he tended to fight battles, right? So um, there, there are four numbers to this. Number one is the enemy. Okay, so the enemy is across the, the battlefield here. Um, his most experienced warriors uh, who were grouped in an age regiment, and I'll talk about what that is in a minute here, uh, would be part of what was called the chest of the formation, right? So this is this is the uh, the animal's chest. The younger, um, more spry, uh, and uh, more aggressive warriors, uh, also in age regiments, would be grouped on the left and right. And as the chest engaged the enemy up close. The younger warriors here, who were part of the horns, as it was called, uh, would flank on both sides, right, and ultimately surround the enemy in a, in a semicircle or maybe a fully engulfing maneuver, um, and they would be surrounded, right. And so this was something we've simply never seen. Uh, the other part here was what was called the loins uh, of the, the buffalo or the bull. Um, and these were kind of reserve troops uh, who were also there in case reinforcements showed up for the enemy, that they would engage them, right? Um, uh, and so this was the standard formation that Shaka began to employ. Um, and Southern African warfare had simply never seen anything like this before, right? Uh, moreover, not only did Shaka utterly defeat his enemies, so rather than, you know, kind of letting them run away and then sue for peace, uh, they would massacre the entire army of the opposing troops and, and sometimes even go beyond that and kill large numbers of women and children uh, and elderly among the enemy. Um, and anyone who didn't, you know, kind of capitulate to them, they, they simply massacred. Okay. Well, understandably, Shaka's troops caused uh, uh, a great deal of consternation among their enemies, uh, even panic. Um, and this is the main thing that spurred this thing called the Umfakane. Um, in addition to that, Shaka used uh, what, something that was already traditional in Nguni society. These are age regiments. Um, and so, you know, we've talked about uh, among the Bantu that they had these initiation rituals. Uh, in any case, um, society was organized according to age regiments. That is, all of the, the men in the society would be grouped together with those who were roughly the same age as they were. Uh, they would be given specific tasks in the society. In the military, you know, the older age regiments would be part of the chest, and the younger age regiments would be part of the bull's horns. Um, the, this, these age regiments formed their main social circle, uh, informed everything they did, and this is one of the ways that... Uh, that these Bantu groups were able to get buy-in from people. If they felt that they were a part of something, this age regiment, then they were more likely to, you know, remain in the society. This is all about power over people again. Um, well, Shaka, you know, used the age regiment uh, um, uh, social organization to kind of merge that with the military and to give these different age regiments their various tasks in the bull's horn maneuver. In addition to that, Shaka had a tremendous amount of charisma, okay, um, and he put this to you. So even though he was described as, as a very ugly person uh, who didn't speak very well, um, he uh, was charismatic in other ways. He knew how to inspire people's imagination. He, he used, for instance, uh, Zulu rituals, um, especially uh, either to um, 
prepare people for battle or to celebrate um, uh, the victory uh, in warfare. Um, and this, you know, helped people to feel good about their identity as, as one of his people. Uh, in addition to that, Shaka, you know, even though he massacred large numbers of people, um, if they wanted to join with him, he incorporated them into his society. Okay. Um, and so he was about inclusion, and, and uh, through all of these means, he was able to get buy-in from people and produce uh, an incredibly aggressive and successful uh, chiefdom, which was called the Zulu chiefdom, or um, the Zulu group. Now... Shaka uh, started his career among the Mtetwa, um, and because he showed promise through these military innovations, uh, he was uh, appointed a war leader by Dingiswayo. Uh, later, when Dingiswayo was captured by the Ndwandwe um, uh, and killed, then the Mtetwa sort of dissolved, and most of the Mtetwa were then incorporated into a new chiefdom that was headed by Shaka, and this was called the Zulu chiefdom. In 1818, uh, the, the Zulu defeated the Ndwandwe in, a, in an utter massacre and, uh, and thus became the dominant power in the entire region of, uh, of east, the eastern part of South Africa, east of the Drakensberg Escarpment. Now, just to kind of finish out the life of Shaka, he was assassinated at the height of his powers. Um, he actually wasn't that, even that old. He was only around 40 uh, when he died, um, he was assassinated by um, his two half brothers. Shaka um, was an illegitimate child. He was a bastard son uh, of his father, um, who was a key official in uh, among the Mtetwa or a, a war leader. Um, but with the support of Dingiswayo, Shaka had kind of leapfrogged his legitimate brothers, and so they harbored a, a grudge against him. Um, and you know, with Shaka at the height of his powers. Um, Within his own court, he was assassinated by his by his two half brothers. Um, one of these half brothers, Dingane, uh, then outmaneuvered his rivals um, and uh, became the king after, and continued to use Shaka's military uh, innovations and the age regiments and all of the things that Shaka had introduced to make the Zulu cohesive uh, into their society. Dingane continued to employ these things, right? And uh, the Zulu became by far the most feared group in the, in the whole region. And, you know, this uh, aggressive imperial expansion uh, created a whole series of, uh, a whole sequence of events that exploded into this Mfikane. Now, just to um, uh, pick up some of the, uh, uh, the readings that we had to do, I want to take a moment and talk about that. All right, so first of all, um, in the, uh, the Williams book, the primary source readings, there's uh, one that I wanted to discuss for a couple of minutes, um, and that is the, uh, it's part two, section B, um, document two, starting on page 82. Uh, Nathaniel Isaacs, uh, a British um, sailor, uh, was shipwrecked um, in South Africa on the coast of uh, KwaZulu-Natal, and uh, made his way to the court of Shaka. Um, and he gave a, a fairly lengthy and, and detailed description of Shaka and the way that he operated. Um, just a couple of passages from this document that I wanted to look at. The top of page 85 in the Williams book, um, uh, he notes, Isaac's notes, it was an invariable rule of war with him never to give his troops more cattle or provisions then would barely suffice to support them till they arrived in the country of their enemy. They had strict injunctions to fight or die, to quarter, and, uh, to quarter on, on their enemy, and not return but as victors, bringing with them the fruits of their triumph. Okay. Now, you know, the question could be asked here, why uh, would he provide only fairly scant rations for them uh, when they're fighting wars? Well, the reason, I think, pretty obviously is that uh, he wanted them to be inspired, uh, to be motivated to conquer. But if, if they knew that they were going to go hungry otherwise, you know, it's a pretty strong motivation to do this. Um, whereas if they've got plenty of provisions and, and uh, things like that, then maybe they wouldn't, you know, they'd say, well, 
um, it's okay. We've, you know, we've got a, a backup plan, so to speak, if we're not successful at this. And, and really, we can see here the innovation in warfare, right? This becomes, a, uh, well, two things. Uh, warfare becomes the key aspect of the Zulu identity. To be a Zulu is to fight and to, and to conquer, okay? Uh, but the second is the, the, the desperation that goes along with this, right? That uh, because Zulus fight, well, if they don't win, if they don't uh, expand, then they're not real Zulus. And, and uh, their, their, their point of existence is, is meaningless, so to speak. Um, uh, and so, you know, when he says you, you need to fight or die, um, and the only way that, you know, you're going to have what you need is to, to conquer someone else. Well, there, there's a, an urgency that goes along with that that was simply uh, unimaginable or unthinkable uh, in previous periods of Bantu history, right? So Shaka, um, this is a good example of, of the kind of leader he was. Um, you might think, okay, well, why would somebody join if, if you know, uh, they were so... Um, there was such an urgency or such a desperation to this. It doesn't seem like a very comfortable position to be in. Well, they were successful. That's the thing. I mean, if they were successful, then they could have all of the spoils of war that they wanted, right? Um, uh, now, there's another thing at the bottom of page 86, and this is the last paragraph in the source. Shaka had an extreme aversion to anything like commercial traffic and forbade it among his people. Towards the Europeans, he always expressed himself decidedly opposed to any, any intercourse, having for its object the establishment of a mercantile connection with his subjects. His whole soul was engrossed by war, and he conceived that anything like commerce would enervate his people and unfit them for their military duties. Now, this, of course, written from a European perspective uh, and uh, really from a pejorative uh, kind of cast of mind, that uh, this is typical of a savage or something like that, right? But this is this is actually fairly common among highly militaristic societies. If we look, for instance, at the ancient Assyrians or the ancient Spartans, we will see the same thing. They uh, forbade or very seriously discouraged any involvement in trade, uh, anything that would distract their people from warfare, right? So... Shaka so thoroughly transformed Unguni society that uh, the, the various options that people had for ways to get by, ways to make a living, um, were reduced to a single one, and that was warfare. And this had uh, tremendously important consequences. Um, the other uh, thing that I, and we can discuss this in the live session, but I, I just wanted to point out um, in the Hamilton book, um, uh, a couple of comments that she makes in the introduction that I think are are vital to understanding this book. Okay, on page three, um, she she's writing about the purpose of the book. Okay, um, uh, she she writes in the middle of the kind of middle paragraph on that page. It, that is this book, is an examination, rather, of how certain symbolic forms and forces were constituted historically, often through the exercise of power, and came to be the founding ideas of a Zulu identity. Right. Um, it looks at the processes by which various features of the pre-colonial world and of the colonial encounter came to be condensed into the figure of Shaka, as well as how, in the, in the course of that condensation, they gathered power and conviction. So one of the things that Hamilton um, uh, points out here, or that she suggests at the very least, is that the, the image we have of Shaka is not necessarily accurate to the context in which he lived, right? He has become such a larger-than-life figure that it's tough to separate the, the legend of Shaka from the historical figure of Shaka. And that's true for a lot of, you know, historical personalities, so this is nothing necessarily uh, surprising. Um, but what is unique about Hamilton's study and about Shaka himself is how 
he has been used by both the uh, well the the the, the various African peoples, uh, especially the Zulus, um, to uh, talk about their identity, their historical claims to territory, to political power, and things like this, and the colonial uh, peoples, right? The Europeans, uh, and the way they have manipulated Shaka in order to, um, uh, well, secure their own political power and to manipulate, you know, the Bantus, uh, to drive a wedge between the Zulus and the other Bantu peoples of South Africa. Um, and so it's, it's actually a good deal more complicated and, and subtle than that. Um, but that, that at least gives us a start into trying to understand what this book is about. Um, you know, you're reading a monograph here, so this is a scholarly study. And um, uh, it, it's you know, something you're, I mean, one of the most important parts of that is to identify an argument and a methodology and all of these things. Um, uh, on page six, she writes, and this is the, the beginning of the first full paragraph, because part of the rationale for the study lies in a desire to reassess the extent to which colonial constructions of Zulu history invented their own shaka, this study is largely confined to a consideration of the constraints and limitations on white inventions and reinventions of Zulu history. Right, so there's this dialectic process between the historic Shaka and the various reinventions of Shaka. Some by the Zulu themselves, but, but many, and maybe even the most significant of these, by the white settlers in South Africa. Uh, and the way that they were able to manipulate Shaka, right? So hopefully you can understand what Hamilton is, is doing there. And again, we can have uh, a further discussion about this book um, uh, in, our, in our live session, okay? So uh, in the next um, uh, lecture, we will talk about how this affects South Africa more broadly. So we've only talked really about Shaka um, and uh, the you know, the early stages of his career, well, there are much longer lasting and, and broader consequences of the creation of a Zulu empire in the eastern part of South Africa, and we will discuss that next time.